I actually decided uh, that I wanted to spend the next few weeks um, before Advent, which is coming up, uh, it's quicker than I'd like. It's coming quick. And Christmas and, and Christmas Eve service planning, which I've done none of. I've actually not started that at all, and I need to get on it. Uh, and I thought, man, what, what can I use in this window right here between here and Thanksgiving? Because there's always like kind of an expectation to preach about something related to Thanksgiving. And then you launch right into Advent after that. Uh, as Methodists, we observe Advent each year. Uh, and that's a very uh, good time for a preacher because it's like already set in stone what you're gonna talk about. Like you, you don't have to worry about it. It's like, these are the themes. This is what we're talking about. This is what time of year it is. We're all remembering, right? It's, a, it's an exercise in leading, remembering. And then I thought, well, you know, like uh, one, of the, one of the great challenges preachers go through is they're like, well, I've said this before. Now, when did I say this before? Was that when I was a youth pastor uh, at Community Bible Church? Was that when I was associate pastor at Bolverde? Have I said that 100 times here as the senior pastor of Hope Arise? When's the last time I said that? And is there any value in saying it now? Right? One of the things we say a lot here is we talk about what we call the five pillars. We talk about them every week in our, our time of offering. They're prayer, presence, gift, service, and witness. In the plan... We talked about how that involves you and how it locates you and, and where uh, and how God relates to you and how that's the plan. But there's a what. That's the why. The why is what we spent the last several weeks talking about. And now what we really ought to talk about is the what. And it's things we've talked about before. And so it might feel a little bit redundant. It might feel a little bit remedial but I was actually talking about this with Julie this morning and she said she took her car in because it's been giving her trouble and she took it in and they couldn't figure it out and they couldn't figure it out and it turns out that all that needed to happen was the tech sat down and said can I sit in the driver's seat for a second think about that statement can I sit in the driver's seat for a second yes of course now all you got to do is push this button this way and she said basically he was just telling me how to drive again because I had basically forgotten. And it dawned on me that we are this way, that Christian disciplines are important. Listen, one of the most beautiful things I see in my entire career is when someone has come to the end of their life and their, and their mind is failing them. And they cannot remember who you are or where they are, but especially my Catholic friends I can walk into that room and just begin a Lord's Prayer or just begin a rosary and they immediately jump in and they can finish it verbatim and they have no idea who I am. But it's so etched in their mind because they had such a fantastic discipline in their lifetime of saying those prayers, of doing that spiritual discipline that it is just etched in there beyond Alzheimer's reach, which is fascinating if you think about it unexplained medically still by the way I've seen musicians have the same ability they've played a guitar so long the discipline of playing it or a piano so long that they don't even know if that's their guitar but if you just put it in their hands they can start to remember chords and songs pianists the same way you can sit them down at a piano and they don't even know where they are and they can begin to play because it's just etched in them. And the spiritual disciplines are this way. We're meant to do them so much that they're etched in us. But sometimes when you do that, you forget why you're doing it. Well, I say the Lord's Prayer. Well, yes, I, I know. But what does it even mean? Well, pff, I don't know. But I could walk into almost any locker room in the state of Texas right now and start a Lord's Prayer and I bet the team could pretty much follow along. Right? It's just something we know. It's, it's a part of our culture. It's, it's a part of, uh, we say it every week here. Our Catholic brothers and sisters have a practice of saying it. Like it's, it's a known prayer. We know the words, but do we know the meaning? So for the next several weeks, we're going to talk through our pillars. And our first pillar is obviously the pillar of prayer. Now, as we were going through some of this work, 
Um, and I'm preparing to lead the Hope 101 class. One of the things we discussed was one of the things that people need is just a basic tool. We need a basic tool. Someone during the plan series said, okay, you're going to tell us that the plan starts with me, but are you going to tell me what to do? I had two responses. I had the one I said out loud and the one I thought. The one I said out loud was, of course I'll, I'll give you some pointers on what to do. The one I thought was like, aren't you a grown adult who's been a Christian a while? If I'm honest. Why do you need me to tell you what to do? There's precedent for this. There's a character in the scriptures who's uh, in the fiery pit and he's begging for a drink. And an angel says, no, I cannot do that. And he says, well, will you at least go and tell my brothers about this place so they will not come here. And the angel's response is simply, they have the prophets, they have the books of the law, they have the Bible. That's all they need to avoid this place. There's some truth in that, right? But sometimes we just need to be reminded together. And isn't the scriptures, don't we call it the living word? Don't we affirm that the Bible can speak to us today? I could read the same passage of the same scripture you've heard a thousand times. And do we not believe that today in this place, the Holy Spirit can make it speak to your current situation, your current place in life? And the thing it meant to you last time is not the thing it means to you this time. So I'm going to read for you a very common passage of Scripture that we just recited, but it's biblical. And then I'm going to give you the tool by which you can understand what this prayer actually means as you consider the discipline of prayer in your own life. Now, the disciples are this, this way. They're walking with Jesus. They're learning from Jesus, and they want to know what in the world are we supposed to do? Now, here's what you got to know. What is Jesus doing every day? Leading. By example. The Bible tells us over and over again, Jesus gets up early in the morning and goes away to pray. And the disciples say, so what are we supposed to do? What do they mean, church? This is not hard to know. What do they mean? Do we have to? Nobody ever raised teenagers, right? I get up on a Saturday and I tell my boys this every week. I need you to do the regular Saturday morning cleaning routine, which means I got to clean the, their bathroom, the toilet, the tub, put away their clothes, make their bed, vacuum the upstairs. It's been the same now for however many years. And I say it the same way every week. After I've made breakfast, maybe, maybe. I mean, maybe they got breakfast. I'm not, I'm not that consistent. But sometimes they get breakfast, right? Sometimes. And we say, go ahead and make, do this, this routine. And almost every week. Some weeks, every once in a while we get a, yes, sir, that will be lovely. We'll do exactly as you have asked. It, ha it does happen. I've got to give them credit. Like maybe 10% of the time. But most of the time it's like a, can I do it after I play some video games? I was going to go fishing with my friends. Can I do it after that? Uh, do I have to? But I, I just put clothes away the other day. There's not that many clothes all spread all over the floor of my room. <laughs> right? Do I have to vacuum? We just did that. It was only like six days ago we did that. <laughs> it's not that bad. This is, this is the nature of the question. It comes here in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus is teaching and preaching, and they're basically like, hey, so how, what are we supposed to do when it comes to prayer? He's showing this every day. Faithful Jewish rabbis had a practice. Jewish men had a practice of praying at 9 a.m., at 1, and at 3, I believe. Maybe 5. I, I might have those mixed up. But three times a day, at an hour specific to the day, and it happens every day. We know this because in the book of Daniel, this is what the king challenges Daniel on. He's like, 
don't go to your window and pray like you say is important to you three times a day and, and do that, that, that routine. You know, keep that to yourself. And Daniel's like, I can't do that. That's not, our, that's not my faith. I can't do that. And of course, we know that, the, so he goes in the lion's den and God's like, I got you. And he doesn't get eaten by the lions. And the king's like, oh, your God's real. My God's fake. And anyways. So they know. They already know. This question is more like a, what do we have to do? What's, what's really, do we have to pray three times a day? Do we have to get up as early as you do and go away to pray? Can we, is there like a cheat code here? Jesus answers them. He says, okay, whenever you pray, don't be a hypocrite. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Have you ever been to a formal prayer event? Like national prayer breakfast or uh, see you at the poll? Or I've been to a few. And the, and the ministers usually prepare their prayers ahead of time. And they, and they, they don't sound like normal language. Oh, most holy and infinite God, who has no gender, we all beseech you on behalf of everyone who could possibly believe in you that we would all be highly exalted and glorified because you are the giver of all blood. And you're like, oh my God, just say what you mean. <laughs> when you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many beautiful words. <laughs> this still happens, is my point. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. Okay, now if I'm teenager follower of Jesus, I'm going to ask this question right here. So then what's the point? <laughs> if he already knows, why do I got to spend my time talking to him about it? In today's vernacular, bruh, why do I got to do that, bruh, bruh, bruh? <laughs> so much bruh. The Father knows what you need before you ask him. So pray then in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not bring us... Uh, to temptation, but rescue us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Interesting tag here. Neither, but if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive you. Now, if I'm teenager follower of Jesus, I know a rhythm of prayer that might sound like this. But this whole like forgiving others so I can be forgiven, that's new information. It's a lot like Jesus doing um, the Last Supper, right? That's just Passover. And then he adds some words that don't go with Passover. He says, well, this is my butt, blood and my body. And they're like, hold on, that's not the Seder. What's he talking? What's, he's going off script. So, a common tool for knowing what the movement of the prayer we call the Lord's Prayer is, is a tool called Acts. If you've heard of this before, just raise a hand. If you've heard of Acts prayer before, just raise a hand. Good, good deal. The A in Acts stands for adoration, that the first movement of prayer when you're talking to the creator of all things is to properly seat the creator of all things. Jesus is on the throne, but you are meant to put him there with your words for your benefit, not for his. 
I'll say more about that in a minute. Adoration. So the first thing we see in the uh, Lord's Prayer is, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Great be your name. Above all things be your name. Now, here's why this matters. This correctly places your worldview. Let me say what I mean. Either God's in charge of it all or he's not. Either you acknowledge that or you don't. To do so, to, to specifically, with your own words, seat again and again Christ on the throne of control over your life as the one who knows better is a very specific way to live. To do anything else is not to be a Christian. I have, I have friends who would deeply disagree with me about this. And I would say to them, I don't know, it's right here. I, I'm going to tell you. Our Father, who art in heaven, great is your name. Not, hey, person who maybe is in charge of all things, who I'm not sure where you are because I've never seen you. Um, thanks for being a bud. Thanks for giving some good instruction I can follow when I feel like it. Every other world religion, church, denies the deity of Jesus Christ. They ascribe different levels of good to Jesus. Prophet, teacher, right? This would be like saying, our divine person who's maybe in charge of things and maybe kind of absent, we're not sure, because sometimes we see you, sometimes we don't, who art in some other ethereal place, um, thanks for the good teachings I sometimes follow. That is not what we believe. That is not how this prayer begins. That is not what it means to begin a prayer with adoration, which is to say, Father, heaven, above all things. Above all things means above everything in my life. Everything I think I know, everything I think I'm better at, everything, every instinct in me that wants to do it my way is to surrender again and again in prayer to the one who's actually in charge. That worldview is very specific and changes things deeply. I like living here. Anybody else like being a Texan? Being a Texan is pretty awesome. I wouldn't mind if that, never mind, I won't say that. <laughs> which also means I'm an American, which I like. There's days I don't love it. Like, it, you know, like, really, we're doing this? Okay, great. But generally, I really like it. Incredible blessings associated with both of those things. Uh, I think the best kind of American you could possibly be is a Texan. And so I feel like I am as blessed as I could possibly be, right? Like, but not everything about that's perfect. Fair? fair. I like being able to vote. I like it. It's a great privilege and blessing to get to, to vote. I think we should all do it. And whoever you're going to vote for, cool. I don't care. I care a little, but not really. I mean, you know, it's a little bit, but are you sure that one? I don't know. But <laughs> that's different talk. I like it. It doesn't matter in the slightest. God would be God if I lived in communist China and had to worship him at the fear of my own life. Right? I'd start this prayer the same way. I'm not in control of what I think I'm in control of. I think I get to vote and it makes a difference somehow. I, I don't know if it actually does, and I don't care, because the one who's in control is, knows better. And when I look out and I see, gosh, this is going terribly. I, didn't, I wouldn't have chosen this at all. I didn't pick that, and I'm going to work hard. I, you know what? I'm going to join a group, and I'm going to do some grassroots stuff, and I'm going I'm to walk house to house, and I'm going to make a difference about that. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, great is your name. All this must somehow be a part of it. I, yes, I can have an opinion. Yes, I can vocalize it. Yes, I can vote. Yes, I can organize and help with things. But the world, as I understand it, is far more under God's control than my understanding of it. Is that? Let me say that again. The world as I see it is far more under God's control than I understand it or can interact with it. And so a best practice for me is to wake up every day and surrender to that in prayer. So here's how it might look. You, you roll out of bed. What's the first thing you think, right? Ooh, that hurts. I don't know. What, what you, that didn't hurt yesterday, right? Or, man, I got a lot to do today. Or how am I going to get the kids to all these things? Or uh, we got to get the house ready for that thing we're hosting. Or I got to get this insurance right because my medical thing is bad. Or right, there's something on our mind. What this means, what this actually means to start prayer with adoration, is to surrender that to God at the very first of the day. It's not to roll and go, "Ooh, that hurts." It's to roll and go, "Good morning, God, who's in control of this knee." that's not loving me right now. I don't know why this is a thing, but you're in charge. And I know I can work on it. I can call a doctor. I can go see a doctor. I can do some physical therapy. I can do things, but at the end of the day, you're in charge. And how this is going to go is up to you. And it might go away I'd like. It might go away I don't like. It doesn't change the fact that you're in charge. And to surrender to that day after day after day is something that, quite frankly, we are terrible at. Because I want to be in charge. I want to think that what I do makes a bigger difference than it makes. I want to think that I'm somehow more important than I am. I am just and only my father's son. And he knows best. And I surrender to that every day, or I don't. This prayer is meant to remind you of that. That is both wonderful news and difficult. Here's how it's wonderful. It's wonderful in this. But that means I don't have to carry all that responsibility and weight. That's God's to carry. It also means that I have got to be more mindful of surrendering myself, my pride, my ego, my wants, to the one who knows better. You didn't know it meant all that, did you? Adoration. C is for confession. This one's pretty straightforward. If the one who knows all things is in, is in charge, then we got to confess we've totally done it wrong. Somewhere yesterday, I got it wrong. Somewhere the day before that, I got it wrong. Somewhere the day before that, I got it wrong. Somewhere today, I'm going to get it wrong. Probably has already happened. I might not even know it. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth and in heaven. Forgive me. Forgive me. How many of us, when we go into prayer, like, man, I can't wait to ask for God to forgive how, how many mistakes I've made. That's usually not how I go in. I usually go in like, listen, listen here, creator. Uh, yep, yep, you're in charge of things, but here's what I need you to do today. <laughs> Anybody? I'm going to need a good grade on this test. I'm going to need a good uh, result on this, you know, thing. I'm going to need this test result to go my way. I'm going to need this to go my way. I'm going to need you to heal that. I'm going to need you to fix this. I'm going to need you to get that done. Anybody? Pulling the lever? Like at Vegas? Want all? Come on, cherries. No, we go in acknowledging that he's in charge and that we are regularly getting it wrong and ask for forgiveness. We follow that with the letter T, with thanksgiving. So adoration, confession, thanksgiving. Giving thanks for all that God is going to do. A, that he did forgive you. That's what we say thank you for first. Because as you do confession, the great joy is is that you know that even before you've said it, you're already forgiven. But it's important to acknowledge. Again, 
teenager probably would be like, well, what do I got to do it then? It's an acknowledging. It's an ownership of. I am not perfect, and I acknowledge it. There's a humility in that. There's a humbleness in that. But we can immediately give thanks for all that God is going to do. Thanks for what? That his kingdom is going to come. That he's going to provide daily bread. That he is going to forgive our debts. That he's going to allow us to forgive others. I don't know, I'm sure y'all know this about me. Things you probably don't tell me you see in my personality, but you see. I'm quite proud. Ha! Ah. <laughs> Couldn't keep it in, could you, Dave? I have a real hard time forgiving. I have a real hard time. Uh... I guess I lean towards justice, which would mean, like, well, that's, I'm owed. I was wrong, I'm owed. That's just. To which God says, cool. Let's go ahead and let you pay up for all your debts. No, no, no. Hold on now. That's why forgive us, our debts comes first. If you understand the size and the scope and the weight of what you've been forgiven, it's meant to make it easy for you to forgive something so much smaller in someone else. Because what God has forgiven is the full scope of every transgression you've ever made. You're forgiving that one transgression that person has made. The Bible's pretty clear on this. Jesus tells a parable about it to drive this point home in which a leader, uh, a person in charge, is owed money. The person who owes comes before him, and the leader says, I'll forgive you your debts. No problem. The person who's forgiven a debt that's large, let's say $100,000, goes outside to someone who owes him like 10 bucks and says, if you don't give me my 10 bucks, I'm going to do what the law requires and have you killed. And the guy says, I can't pay. Well, the leader who forgave... $100,000 finds out that the guy he forgave went out and demanded the $10, calls him in and says, guess what, now you owe me because you missed the point. We're thankful that we have been forgiven and we're thankful that we get to forgive, that we're given the great blessing and opportunity to forgive others. And I struggle with that one. Well, Jesus, you need to deal with them. I mean, I won't, I won't, I won't hold it against them, but I'm going to need you to smite them, okay? <laughs> so I'm clean. I forgave them. I did, but I need you to go ahead and do your thing. And No. How many of us see and the opportunity to forgive, the possibility that that person we're going to forgive will see God's great love for them in our forgiveness? The answer for me is never. I have never thought that. I never think to myself, you know what? Let me demonstrate how much God loves this person by forgiving them like God has forgiven me. I mean, what are we talking about here? Let me do that. That's not the first thought, but that is the picture God wants to paint. He wants them to be so surprised by that act in you that it, it immediately shows them how big God's love for them is. Well, I should not have been forgiven by Reese for that. I mean, like I really wronged him a lot. So that he would do that is surprising. Huh, maybe this God thing's real. The S is for supplication. So we've gone adoration, Confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Supplication simply means to pray for others. Now, here's something that I've learned over the years. We want to do this prayer backwards. When I gather prayer requests on Sunday, how many cards are focused on the letter A? Most of our cards don't say something like, we're just, my prayer today is just, praise be to God that he's in charge of all things. Most of our cards, none of our cards are confession. 
Well, I lied yesterday, so I want to pray about that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> we're, not telling, we're not telling anybody our stuff, right? That, that's, that's private. I mean, he did say, go behind a closed door and pray. He did not say, do it out loud. Some of our cards are Thanksgiving. There's, there's an uptick here for sure. Uptick for sure in the Thanksgiving de department. Most are supplication. I couldn't possibly think of a way I want to be prayed for, but I'd like for you to pray for my aunt, cousin, nephew, grandparent, their dog, car, leg, cancer. We, we supplicate a lot. And that's a good thing. It's just backwards. Supplication comes. Think of it this way. If God isn't the God of the letter A, the one who is above all things and deserves our adoration, and if God isn't the God who can receive your confession and give you full pardon, if God isn't the God who makes it possible for you to be provided for and to, that you would be thankful for this daily provision or this, and this opportunity to be forgiven and to forgive others, if God isn't those things, then he can't do anything about the next category. All your hopes for supplication, that, that he'll intervene on behalf of cancer and illness and heartbreak and financial problems and all of that is a pipe dream and a hope at best if the first three aren't true. So why in the world do we lead with the last one, right? And we do this. Something about it feels um, righteous. Well, I'm praying for other people. I'm not, I'm not even focused on myself. I'm just totally focused on others. And that's good. But we got to get the order right. Because if God is not the God who's above all things and who can forgive all things and who can provide all things, then God is not the God who can answer all things for others. So don't be, don't be so quick to only offer prayers for others. There is an appropriate order here. To pray for yourself, for your own adoration, confession, and thanksgiving, and then once aligned correctly to pray for others. Because if you believe that God can truly intervene, then he is the God worth adoring. He is the God worth confessing. And he is the God worth giving thanks to. There's an interesting tag to the Lord's Prayer and to this text. The text ends after uh, rescue us from evil with this. If you forgive others, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive you. So prayer is about forgiveness somehow. How should we pray? Like this. So that it can unlock forgiveness in you. I don't totally understand that, frankly. But it's the truth of the text. Somehow, being able to pray unlocks the ability to forgive others in you. And it's an ability you're going to need because if you don't do it, God doesn't forgive you. Which is interesting that God puts a condition on it. But it's right here. These are Jesus' words in Matthew. This is not Matthew's take on that. We end the Lord's Prayer this way, right? Instead of saying, so that we might resist temptation and help us to pray this prayer so we can forgive others so you'll forgive us. That's not how we end that prayer. We end it with this tag. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen, right? Okay, the reason for that is it was added on early in the first century by the first century church and we've just kept up the practice. That's the, that's the church history answer. There's nothing special. It's from 2 Chronicles. It's biblical. It's straight out of the Bible. And it's good. But maybe, and this is pure speculation on my part, the reason it's there is so that we'll remember the first part. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And if that's true, is there anything in that God that can't help us forgive others so that we might also be forgiven. If you end your prayer with a reminder 
that God has all the power you could possibly need to do the thing you think you cannot do. Because I bet in this prayer, the thing we think we cannot do, if I told you you had to leave here today and do it, is you have to leave this room and you have to go forgive everyone you've never forgiven or God won't forgive you. I think you would be pretty disappointed and dismayed. Well, I don't know if I can do that. I got some things I'm still working on. I mean, like 90% I'm cool with, but there's that one person who, I mean, that was a big offense. You can, I don't even talk about that with my counselor, pastor. Like, I, we can't deal with that one. It's, the, it's a third rail. Can't touch it. Well, if thine is the kingdom and all the power and all the glory forever, yes, you can. Because that God lives in you. That God wants to give you that power to forgive. He wants to unlock that in you. Because it's the best picture of who God is to that person who needs that forgiveness from you. Yeah, it's hard to think about that. It's even more awkward to think about, well, we haven't talked in 20 years. They don't know I haven't forgiven them for that. How in the world am I going to do that? I don't know. But thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. He'll help you make a way. Amen? Amen. This is the nature of what prayer is meant to do. It's meant to orient you daily. It basically does this. You're God. I'm not. Let's do this thing. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you that you're God and we're not. That's not a job I think I could do. I know I try to take over sometimes and do it anyway. But remind me that even in this prayer that I can be reminded daily that it is not mine to do, but it is yours. That my life is not mine, but it is yours. That my purpose is not mine, it's yours. My provision is not mine, it's yours. My forgiveness is not mine, it's yours. So God, have your way in my life and give me good reminders to pray in this pattern of adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication daily so that it just correctly places me each day by discipline. I pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.